My talk today is titled The Themes and Functions of Ancient Rhetoric in the Anti-Slavery Activist Writings of Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford. The purpose of today's talk is to examine Reverend Stanford's engagement in ancient Mediterranean rhetoric, particularly Greek and Latin references. I'm going to begin by providing you all with an overview of classical rhetoric in 19th century transatlantic abolitionist activism. I will then focus on Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford's text, The Tragedy of the Black Person in America, that was published in 1897. This talk ends with a discussion of the implications for teaching about such texts in global education today and directions for future research. To help guide the examination of classical rhetoric in Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford's writings, I'm asking these main questions. What ancient narratives are being engaged by Reverend Stanford? What are the possible rhetorical functions of these ancient references? How do these references compare to the writings of other black anti-slavery activists on the transatlantic circuit? I hope that by exploring answers to these questions, we can learn even more about the textured and rich content of persuasive speeches by black authors through the centuries. To begin, I'll talk briefly about what I mean when I say ancient or classical rhetoric and address the traditional ways this rhetoric has been used in anti-slavery work. In the 19th century in America and Europe, education largely meant classical and religious education, and this education was reserved mainly for white people. And so Greek and Latin education over the centuries, especially since the 1400s in Europe, had become white education. And this was particularly true in America in the 19th century. Despite the reality that the ancient world was diverse and did not operate on racism, race as a social construct was not formed yet. But its root ideologies of difference and discrimination were taking hold and philosophers like Aristotle had argued that there were people born as quote natural slaves who were meant to be enslaved. While at his time in the 4th century BC, this did not mean black people, his arguments were picked up, expanded, and ultimately became one of the main pillars for racist enslavement of black people beginning in the 1400s across Europe. While some people have used ancient ideology to support racism and enslavement, others have used it to fight that very racism and enslavement. Fast forward to the 17, 18, and 1900s, there are many ancient Mediterranean references in the freedom narratives of black people who were formerly enslaved. For example, discussions of the Roman goddess of freedom, Libertas, mentions of the assassination of Caesar, and the Windicta, a wand or a rod that was used in the ceremony of freedom, as well as, of course, Christian references. Themes include escape, overcoming oppression, and divine intervention to gain freedom. Many of these references are woven between biblical references and narratives of personal pain and suffering and enslavement. A challenge in examining the works by black authors on the transatlantic anti-slavery circuit is the filtering of their experiences through white people. One example of this is in the writings of another transatlantic anti-slavery activist, Henry Box Brown. His first narrative was written by a white man named Charles Stearns, and the other was written by Brown himself. What we find in comparing the two is that Charles Stearns' edition is dripping with classical references from beginning to end. However, when Brown wrote his own narrative, there are hardly any, with the exception of the biblical references. Stearns, in fact, had been criticized in book reviews for being overly wrought, and it seems the depth and quantity of ancient references and allegories were part of that. One thing I want to note here is that, interestingly, when we talk about ancient and Latin rhetoric, biblical references are often considered by scholars and authors as separate. However, the historical time of Jesus was in and under the Roman Empire. And Emperor Augustus and Christianity originated from the ancient Mediterranean culture. 
Therefore, aren't biblical references ancient and also Mediterranean? So this constructed divide is especially curious when you think about the fact that the earliest editions of the New Testament were written in Greek. And so looking back on Henry Box Brown, we see a great deal of Christian and biblical references that in truth are of antiquity, but are often not categorized as being ancient. For this presentation, I limit my examination to non-biblical references to control for the unique complexities of such religious dialogue. However, I am brainstorming how this divide between ancient and biblical can and should be dissolved in some ways, or at least pushed back on and properly contextualized. So I welcome feedback and suggestions for such an approach. But today we'll go ahead and just focus on non-biblical ancient references to give some more feasible parameters for analysis. So now I want to turn to Reverend Stanford, offer a brief bio of who he is, and then share with you all specific examples of classical rhetoric in his writings. Reverend Peter Thomas Stanford was born enslaved in Virginia in the United States. He eventually self-emancipated by sneaking in a coal box of a train when he was a young teenager. He became a minister and an anti-slavery activist in America, Canada, and England. And we celebrate him and his contributions as the first black minister of Highgate Baptist Church in Birmingham, UK. He wrote and published a great deal, including two memoirs, The Plea of the Ex-Slaves Now in Canada in 1885 and From Bondage to Liberty in 1889, as well as three editions of the textbook titled The Tragedy of the Black Person in America, which will be referred to as The Tragedy. The Tragedy is a history text. In this book, Stanford recounts the history of enslavement. He examines not just the history, but the brutality, freedom, hope, and the current state of things in the late 19th century. Throughout this text, there are allusions and reference to classical imagery, including assassinated emperors and the role of Greek and Latin in the education system. For this presentation, I'm looking at just uh, the 1897 edition and I have chosen to spotlight three examples in the text of classical rhetoric and explore their possible functions. The first example can be found on page 13 of his text, The Tragedy. It says, the Phoenicians who lived in cities on the coast of Syria, one of which was ancient Tyre, were devoted to the pursuit of the sea and established colonies on the north coast of Africa and created extensive commerce. It is said of them that they were the first people to circumnavigate Africa and that Necho, who ascended the throne of Egypt in the year 617 BC, was the navigator. So what is the function of such a passage? Here it establishes historical past with an understanding of the, the early origins of maritime trade and activity in the ancient Mediterranean and identifies colonization in earlier routes far before any understanding of a European global colonization effort. A precedence of population shift, migration, and takeover. So one function we can say is historical lineage. So the second example is found just on the very next page. And Reverend Stanford states, Herodotus, who was born in the year 484 BC, was the first Greek who traveled in quest of distant lands and the founder of Gratian geography. He explored Egypt as far as the cataracts of the Nile and made excursions into Libya and Arabia and subsequently wrote accurate descriptions of the countries he visited. And so what we see here is not only does Reverend Stanford connect the history he's given of colonialization and enslavement to the ancient world, but he's also connecting himself to the lineage and legacy of historians like Herodotus. So Herodotus today is known as the father of history the author of the first history text, which was titled The Histories, uh, which chronicles especially 
the Greco-Persian Wars of the 6th and 5th centuries BC. The Greek word historia appears in the first line of, the, of his text, and he states, this is a history. And the original meaning of historia was investigation. So a history is not the truth for whatever that means, but is instead an investigation of things that have happened. What's interesting here is that many scholars today, and even some ancient scholars in the past, strongly doubt that Herodotus actually traveled to many of the places he wrote about. Because what he wrote seemed to be wildly exaggerated and offensively exoticizing. He even spoke of giant ants that harvested gold in Egypt. Nevertheless, however true or exaggerated Herodotus' history was, one function of this reference for Stanford uh, remains to establish a connection to someone who is revered in the writing of history, and that is Herodotus. And to illustrate a knowledge of the genre and its legacy, seemingly building off and informed by the works of ancient historians. The last example from Stanford we'll look at is from page 187, the end of his textbook. This is an ex excerpt from his story on Judge George Lewis Ruffin, the first black man to graduate from Harvard Law School in 1869. Stanford states, he was one of a family of 12 children whose parents engaged a broke down student at an enormous price to teach their children with the result that at 16 years of age, George was not only well grounded in common English studies, but had some knowledge of Latin and the classics and an excellent taste in English literature. At this time, his mother, having decided that no effort which was for the ultimate good of her family was too great to be made, broke up her southern home, came north with her brood, and settled in Boston, where they might have every advantage possible. Here, George attended Chapman Hall School and afterwards studied at law at Harvard and later in the office of Harvey Jewell Esquire. Before beginning the study of law, he began to earn his living as a barber, opening a shop on Green Street. After his admission to the bar, a good practice at once opened up to him. So what is the role in the mention of classical education in Greek and Latin in this narrative? Not only does this illustrate the domination of ancient studies education in the 19th century, but also traces steps of success leading to grad school, uh, to law school at Harvard, and to becoming a judge. And so we see ancient knowledge being used as a marker for success for a black man. There's a lot more to say about this reference, and it foreshadows great debates between W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington regarding the role of Greek and Latin education for black people in America in the early 20th century. But that is a huge topic that would take us beyond the scope of this presentation. However, it's extraordinarily important to acknowledge this tension and see this as an example of challenging who owns what knowledge and how does racism control the answers to that question. So those were the references made by Stanford himself and some of my thoughts on their themes and functions. But I want to take a minute to discuss the introduction, which was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. In the vein of Herodotus, she states that Stanford's book, The Tragedy, is a, quote, report of inquiries made, unquote, which when I read those words really brought me back to the beginning of Herodotus and how he himself began his history. This is the historia, the investigation, and so on. But interestingly, she adds, the writer aims not at sensation, but desires first to see for himself the facts in their true light, and having seen, give to his readers an unexaggerated statement thereof. No cause is assisted by falsehood, no race of men can be permanently helped forward by fraud. Two things about this statement. One, this is fascinatingly similar to how Thucydides starts his history text called the Peloponnesian War. 
So Thucydides is writing in the 5th century BC just after Herodotus. And Herodotus had been criticized for exaggerating and even inventing history. So Thucydides himself states in his historical text that he does not exaggerate. His material is not made up. So I believe this intro functions to, quote, legitimize what Reverend Stanford writes. Reading John Sakura's Black Message White Envelope article really helped me to see this function. And this feeds right back into the filtering and control that white people, particularly in America, felt they had the right to do. Harriet Beecher Stowe, a white female author from Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, in fact, I myself live here in Hartford, Connecticut, just a couple miles from our house that is now a museum. And before the pandemic, I was able to visit the, the Stowe house uh, before I'd actually even moved here. And I was allowed access to the archives and I examined her letters. In them, she talks of her son complaining of learning Latin and she makes clear that she values classical education. Therefore, trained as she was, and as she expected her children to be, she is an example of how mixed ancient Mediterranean rhetoric is reflected in the literature of white people. And this is an important point because black authors who engage in the same kind of combination of ancient references, Thucydides, Herodotus, or, or what have you, have been historically dismissed as parroting or simulating knowledge, but not having real knowledge, including Phyllis Wheatley and Toni Morrison more recently. However, even a cursory examination of white literature, whether pro or anti-slavery, or on another topic altogether, demonstrates similar patterns. So what these references mean and their function in different contexts deserves a great deal more attention. So given the context of white education and the largely white audiences on the anti-slavery circuit, in comparison to other texts of similar nature, I argue that Reverend Sanford and others creatively used ancient Mediterranean imagery like this to encourage empathy and promote abolition among their majority white audiences who they knew would be inclined to connect to references of old, such as Caesar, Augustus, the Roman goddess, uh, Herodotus, Thucydides, uh, Phoenicians. To be clear, I do not believe the only goal for engaging with ancient rhetoric was the persuasion of white people, for there were many advantageous reasons for black people to engage in the pillars of education at that time outside of anything to do with white people. However, with more comparative research in early black literature, I do think an argument could be made that the ancient references in these texts in particular in their context, had this central aim. Recently on Classics Twitter, there has been increased tension in examining the field, and many are advocating for a change of framing and perspective. Sarah Bond especially proposes making a global antiquity department uh, instead of classics to help dissolve the exceptionalism of Greek and Roman rule, which has been appropriated by white supremacists and can now be found in the clothing, the flags, the words of the insurrectionists in the U.S. on January 6th when they stormed the Capitol. All of this reinforces a false and constructive perception of who owns knowledge and who has the power to territorialize it and shut others out. These are the outcomes of nearly 600 year shift in the world's relationship with ancient Mediterranean literature, language, and culture. I support this change of perspective to global antiquity, and I believe it can expand how we read, understand, and engage in the ancient worlds. This does not mean we abandon Greek and Latin, but instead that we ask new questions of who, how, why so many activists from so many different sides find meaning in tapping into ancient rhetoric. Greek and Latin are not inherently white knowledge languages but its domination in white education and the weaponizing of classical languages to support white supremacy is very real and very complicated, but it is not absolute. And so understanding the themes and functions can help us understand how systems of violence such as racism and enslavement were built and ways in which they can be dismantled. I think an important angle is the role of this type of examination in the classroom. 
whether in ancient studies classroom, black literature, or a course on anti-slavery activism, there are ways to embed this knowledge and its complexity in our curriculum to add a dynamic dimension to knowledge, education, gatekeeping, uh, and the power of rhetoric and examining such rhetoric. I am currently searching through over 200 documents in the University of North Carolina online digital collection to create a database of classical references and freedom narratives to further develop my work. One of the challenges is that so many narratives are written by or filtered through white people. And so analyzing the function of classical narratives in these works must take that context into consideration. Just as Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote in the intro of Reverend Stanford's tragedy of the black person in America. I believe that by diving deeper into the questions and complications I presented here today, we can experience the agency and complexity in black-led transatlantic anti-slavery activism in new ways that help to dismantle the deficit perspective aimed at black authors still today and beat back white supremacist narratives of knowledge and education. And so in sum, I plan to continue analysis of this database, continue examining ancient references in black transatlantic anti-slavery literature, find new ways to challenge the racist filtering of historic texts, create pedagogically useful material to address these complex issues in the classroom. Thank you.